Okay, I'm going to talk about group life insurance and what you'll need to know about group life insurance to pass your life insurance pre-licensing exam. I hope you find value in this. Subscribe to the channel and turn on post notifications. And if you have any questions, email me at jve at the jve.com. So group life insurance. Now group life insurance is issued to many people in a group. If you've ever worked at a company before and you got life insurance when you worked there, you were part of a group policy. Those are like really com a really common form of group life insurance is that like standard $20,000 death benefit you get when you, when you work somewhere and you have to pick a beneficiary. Now, that policy though is not owned by you. That policy is owned by the company or the sponsoring group, which would be your employer in that situation. So typically it's an employer employee relationship where group life insurance comes into effect. Now, there are other groups that qualify, but in order for them to be a qualifying group to get group life insurance, they can't be a group just for the sole purpose of getting insurance. So they, pro they had to have been a group already in some other sense. Now, the insurance company, it takes some risk. It takes less risk, sorry, less risk with these policies being spread out through every single person that, that works there. That's why when you got that life insurance policy, you didn't have to go through any underwriting. So it was guaranteed insurability because they say they have you and then all the other employees there, and if they pool it all together, the risk is less spread out, okay? So they take more of a risk insuring just you than they do insuring every single person because they know they're gonna get premiums for every single person there every month as opposed to just getting a premium from you and taking that one risk on you because they say, hey, there's gonna be some healthy people, there's gonna be some young people, there's gonna be some sick people, there's gonna be some old people, there's gonna be some smokers, there's gonna be some non-smokers. So the whole risk is balanced out throughout the group, okay? Now, like I said, evidence of insurability is not required. And what you'll actually get, because you don't own the policy, you don't get a policy, you'll get a certificate of insurability or a certificate of insurance showing that you have coverage. It's just a little certificate. Now, the main master policy is given to the employer or the sponsor. In underwriting for this to determine what the rates are that will have to be paid, now, in that situation, the company is paying for the whole thing. But there are some where you will pay part of it too, and the company will pay for some of it. So someone is paying for it at the end of the day, bottom line. Even if you aren't, your employer pays for it. And they think they get to like write that piece off. So it's like a tax incentive for them. But based on the group characteristics and makeup determines the price that the employer has to pay per person. So at first, it's based on the purpose or the nature of the group. Okay, so like what is this group for? Like what do they do, okay? If they're like a massive group of rock climbers, then it's probably gonna cost a little bit more money than if someone, if they're just like working in a factory folding boxes. So what's the purpose or the nature of the group? And once again, you can't just form a group just for the sole purpose of getting life insurance. That can't be like the reason why the group was formed. Next is based on the size. So the larger the group, the more accurate the actuarial predictions will be and the less risk the company actually takes. Another thing it's based on is turnover. So these insurers expect steady turnover in a company where the older people are leaving and then younger people are coming in. Okay, it can't be like no younger people coming in and everybody just getting older in the group. Okay, so if there's a good turnover rate, then that's gonna lower the premium as well. That'll help determine and influence the premium. Then financial strength. It's based on the financial strength. Like, hey, can the company pay or can the group pay? Does the company have the money to actually pay these premiums? What's their income look like? Gender, too. What's the ratio of men to women? So, like, it's not always like, well, there's this many women and this many men, and the men and women pay the same um, uh, premium. So, what's the ratio of men to women? It's balanced out. And then the age. It's based on the average age. So, it's just kind of like based on averages of the group and the group as a whole, rather than one individual person's uh, sh flaws or, or risks actuarially. Okay, actuarially means pertaining to the underwriting that they use to figure out, hey, how long is someone gonna live? So there's also a minimum amount of people that are required to participate in. Now there are conversion privileges too. So say you had this $20,000 policy. Okay, so you get a $20,000 policy from working somewhere and you leave. Now you can actually convert that policy into a permanent, a whole life policy or anything except a term policy for that same $20,000 face mount. So you have a $20,000 face mount, your employer, you leave, you get to keep it when you leave, but your premium is going to be based on your gender and how old you are. And it's also going to be based on um, the, 
what type of policy you're purchasing. So whole life or universal life typically. But you now have to pay that premium. And in most cases, and everyone pays a standard rate. So in most cases, it doesn't make sense to, to convert that policy because it's usually gonna be really expensive. And, and the only time it would make sense is if someone left the company and they were like super sick, deathly ill, because they could probably get a cheaper policy somewhere else. Bottom line, they usually make the rates so that people wouldn't wanna buy the policy when they leave because they're no longer part of the group. And the company says, hey, you're more of a risk to us now that you're not part of this group. So we don't wanna take that risk anymore. You'll still be able to convert it, but you're gonna pay a price for that. So if someone's healthier and, and younger, it usually doesn't make sense for them to convert that policy. I've run into some situations where I've seen people convert their group life insurance policy to an individual personal policy because it made sense because they were unhealthy and they had some really bad health issues, but usually that doesn't make sense, okay? So people usually can convert this policy within 31 days of leaving the group, all right? And if that master policy that the, that the employer owns over the group is canceled, then people in that group who have had the policy for five years or more are able to convert it to a permanent policy without providing any evidence of insurability. So that's kind of how it works when you leave. Other than that, you lose it. Most people just don't just decide not to, uh, not to convert it. Now, there's two types of plans. There's um, based on payment. So contributory versus non-contributory. So a non-contributory plan is when 100% of the eligible employees are in it and it's when the employer pays the whole thing. So non-contributory means non-contributory for the employee. So the employee does not have to pay anything. So for that $20,000 plan, it would be a non-contributory plan for me because I don't actually have to pay into it. I just start working there, I sign something, say, hey, who's gonna get the money when I die and then that's it. But a contributory plan is usually when I wanna add some extra. Okay, so if I wanted to add some extra, then the employer would either I cover it or the employee and I share it. That's in 75% of eligible employees must participate in that for it to be active. In the non-contributory, every eligible employee, 100% of eligible employees have to be in it for, with the employer. So the, if it's a non-contributory, the employer has to pay for it for everyone no matter what. Not in a contributory, only 75% of eligible employees have to be, actually be entered into it. So. That's the basis of group life insurance. The risk, it's usually annually renewable term. There are some companies that do uh, group whole life. And um, I know uh, there's a company, I'm not gonna use their name, but there's a company that has a good group whole life policy, but it's very rare. It's usually annually renewable term, which means it's the cheapest form of pure and purest form of life insurance you can get. It's a super cheap term policy for that single year. And that's it. So usually it's annually renewable term and if you want to learn about annually renewable term, then all you got to do is check out this video that's coming up right here and you'll be able to learn about every single life insurance policy that you'll need to know about for your life insurance license exam. Reach out to me if you want to learn what we do here at my agency and I can help you sell and make a lot of money with me. My email is jve at thejve.com. Thank you.